Good afternoon, everyone. We're going to get started for um, the concurrent session on facing substance use and mental health challenges with facts and moral courage. We have two presenters for today. Ms. Rosalind Holiday moore who's the Senior Public Health Analyst in the Office of Behavioral Health Equity, Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration. And joining us at the table is Dr. Marsha Riggs, who's at the J. Erskine Love Professor of Christian Ethics um, at the Columbia Theological Seminary. Um, they will both be presenting. Um, I'm Julio Dicente Lapierre. I'm in the Office of Minority Health and Health Equity, and I'll be um, keeping time as well as taking some uh, minimal notes um, and then uh, helping with facilitation, uh, facilitating the discussion after the presentations. So we'll start with um, Ms. Moore. Take it away. Uh, thank you all for joining. I'm looking forward to the conversation that we've planned. Um, I think it will be a little bit easier if we can be tighter, but I, I don't like to ask people to move if you're settled in at the moment. No, I no, I get, and it's it's really um, a privilege to be able to engage as many people at a distance as we are with this afternoon's conversation. So I know it's not just limited to those in the room, and, and I'm glad about that. So my my focus will be on substance use and mental health issues, but I, I'm going to start the conversation with a question that I'd like everyone to focus on for a moment. And it's looking at the what if. What if behavioral health equity was the starting point for decision-making and innovation? Sometimes we get to the place of equity at the end, but if we flip the switch and we have that as the driver of how we think. I want to use that question in framing the way you look at the next set of slides that will give you a snapshot, a snapshot of how we are understanding binge and heavy alcohol use among people age 12 and older. And as you look at the slide, I'd like you to just pay attention to the tan bar for a moment because it's showing you a focus on binge drinking that creates a different vulnerability than regular alcohol misuse. And I also want you to look at the age range, starting at 12. So imagine, if you would, someone you know in that age category who might be vulnerable to binge drinking. And at the same time, still with that question around behavioral health equity in your mind, thinking about the use of illicit drugs. And as we look at the bars here, we also see an alarming number of young people engaging in the use of illicit drugs. And the tan bar showing a larger number of those 18 to 25. And so for those in our virtual space, as well as those in the room, you to focus on this morning's panel, and to think about the brilliance that we heard and the age in which young people are more vulnerable to alcohol and substance misuse. And as we know, our national narrative on opioid misuse is rampant and growing. Again, looking at the prevalence for those 12 to 17, as well as 18 to 25. And at this place, the data not only shows illicit drug use, ages 12 to 17, but it highlights something different. Those with major depressive episodes within a year. And as you look at that, and listening to this morning's discussion, it underscores the need for better understanding how we can move in front of conditions that are rooted in mental health and substance use issues. 
unaddressed mental health needs very often create pathways to alcohol misuse and illicit drug misuse. That's what this slide is pointing to. And earlier today, I talked about, with a group that was before this, that these data slides very often are not the points that people want to focus on. They're not interesting, they're not trendy, they're not colorful, they're informative and they're important. But this is too often what we see. Social media, mainstream media, our public leaders speaking to both the crises, the needs, but also solution. But if you're in the average public domain, it all starts to sound the same. So for 17 seconds, I'm using 17 intentionally, I want you as an individual, and for those in the virtual space, you have the opportunity to share with us using the, the chat feature or uh, Twitter, some of what you are seeing here and through the previous slides as most significant. What is standing out for you that may not have been in the forefront of your mind at the beginning of this conversation? And so there will be 17 minutes of silence. Seconds. Thank you. Seconds. Thank you for taking time to reflect. And while we're not going to take moments at this point to ask you what bubbled up, I am going to ask you to save that thought because I want you to put it in the place of moving forward now, thinking how what's significant can be better aligned with what's actionable. What are we doing? How are we thinking about the cultural frames in which people are experiencing some of these conditions? What are the cultural frames that are underpinning the occurrences that are reflected in the data? And how do we understand culture as a, as a pivotal point, one of the pillars of how we move forward? How do we think about culture as a strength and not always as a second thought, as an aside? What are the drivers here that allow us to break through points of isolation that help us identify new people to work with, strategies for building awareness, new ways of thinking about expression. Sometimes it's leveraging the way it used to be said. Sometimes it's the new way of doing it. But culture is very often the driver that sets the stage for how we create partnerships and how we frame partnering. So I decided that today would be a good opportunity for us to think about not just the partners, but also the partnering. How do we take action? How do we create those steps on the, on the bridge that was mentioned in the opening remarks? And so I've identified three different resources here that are all in the public domain, but all reflecting new ways of partnering with different industries, with federal agencies, and with ways in which the voices of young people are rising to the top. In addition to that, you see through these sites a way in which we combine health education material with interactive options so that there are live chats. And so when we think about the infusion of social media in our everyday experiences, is there a new way of thinking about the way we communicate with each other? And that that communication can also be brought to the forefront of how we can think about prevention and, and the effectiveness of prevention. So from my home base, the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration, we also manage a network that I'd like to invite everyone to join. It's a network established for communities who are 
prioritizing and focused upon the support of diverse populations in addressing mental health and substance use needs. So here we have the National Network to Eliminate Disparities in Behavioral Health. We affectionately call it the NED, but it's a way in which you and your community can join other partners around the nation in thinking forward about strategies. Some of them are emerging directly from communities. Some of them are developed and designed, implemented by young people. Others reflect partnerships that are new and innovative. But all of them, all of them are being focused on promoting health and equity across every community. And we start with seeds. There's a repository of best practices that we invite you to submit ideas around. And today I heard a number of them that would be more than eligible to fit into this space. It's also a way that you can connect with other partners in different parts of either your state or across states that may have similar challenges, but you're looking for solutions. And so here we have a, a way that not only can you provide a voice, but you can hear what other people are sharing. And while we have a number of resources. I've brought some to share with everyone here. So on the back of the room, there's a table with resources I encourage you to, um, to take and to definitely use once you return home. But I want to focus attention on the last resource that's on this slide, which is National Prevention Week. It's May 12th through the 18th of this year. And you'll see here, we're asking everyone to take action for prevention. And so there's a wristband and uh, the wristband has a number of tools and resources that you can use when you go home, but also a brochure that um, can help guide some of the actions that you might want to initiate. And for those of you who are in the virtual space, these resources are available on SAMHSA's website. They are downloadable and aside from the wristband, but you can order them and everyone in your community can have access to, to these tools. The idea here is that we are creating champions, creating champions where they already exist and where they don't exist to establish new platforms for those voices to be heard. And so with this, I am asking everyone here not only to reflect, but to move forward, that we have a chance to think about equity versus equality, that we have a chance to take action to promote equity, and that as partners, this will be our time to make the difference that everyone knows to be most important. Thank you very much. And now we'll follow with Dr. Ricks. Can I go to the Yeah. <laughs> Since the uh, presenter this morning um, did such an excellent job of talking about ethics and ethical theory, I decided I would shift my presentation a little. Because what I want to do is talk to you about what ethicists do. Um, and we have three tasks that we normally do. One is descriptive, one is analytical, and the other is normative. But what I think is most important is the way in which we describe the context in which we live in order to think about, you know, the, the challenges of doing public health around substance abuse and mental health. Uh, and one of the ways to describe our context is that there is the omnipresence of violence. And So I want you to look at the diagram and take this as a visual representative of the way I want you to think about how the context looks.
So if you think about the context, it's one in which there's an omnipresence of violence. And by that, I don't simply mean episodic events of violence, but that we live in a context in which harm is often done in a variety of ways to different groups of people. And that is where I can begin to talk about describing the dynamics of the context of seeking to address substance abuse and mental health challenges. Um, if we think about, for example, uh, the omnipresence of violence around drug and alcohol abuse in terms of the way that the media and pop culture, for example, represent that behavior as somewhat acceptable or even romanticize it such that youth and young adults may think that it's a way to be grown up to engage in such behavior. Or if adolescents and youth live in communities where life is hard economically, for example, some adults they know may engage in substance abuse uh, and alcohol <clears throat> abuse as means to survive, to escape the harshness of the context in which they live. So at that point, adolescents and youth are kind of caught in a kind of tension between seeing behavior that has been told to them by some people is destructive but represented in the culture as acceptable or finding that the only way some of the adults in their lives can make it in their harsh context is to engage in substance and alcohol abuse. Likewise, mental health disorders are constantly today used to explain or even demonize individuals who commit acts of mass violence. Well, if that's the case, why wouldn't uh, an adolescent think, wow, I don't want to admit that I have a mental health issue because I might get demonized. Or in some of their racial ethnic communities and religious communities, they hear that mental health disorders are not signs of illness that are treatable, but instead they are described as perhaps lacking in character or faith. So once again, you have adolescents caught in a tension between real physical, mental, uh, and psychic distress that may result in substance abuse and or coincide with mental health struggles and they find themselves without parents or other adults with whom they can speak about the struggle. So when we live in this context of the omnipresence of violence, it becomes important to think about what are the tensions that drive us when we begin to think about making ethical choices or practicing our professions even uh, in ethical ways. Well, one of the ways I do that is to ask people to think about living into tensions. And living into tensions means that you recognize that the context is filled with the omnipresence of violence, but it's also a context where there's the omnipresence of justice. And so in macro and micro context, we're all living out our lives struggling between what are the values of a culture of deception and what are the values of a culture of moral courage? And how do we live 
neither in neither one totally because we can't, but how do we live in that overlap and begin constructing ethical ways of being and practicing that will allow us to find creative, constructive ways to engage these issues. So one of the ways that I would want you to think about it from a public health ethics perspective is to think about, you know, perhaps there are principles that guide the way public health ethics operates. And some of those might be non-maleficence or uh, a principle about doing no harm, beneficence, a principle about how do we do good uh, for individuals and collective good, or health maximization. You know, how can interventions actually do the most good for the most people? <laughs> or how can we provide our services in ways that are efficient, so a principle of efficiency, uh, how do we have respect for the autonomy of individuals? At the same time, we have to think about what's the public good? How do we think about justice? You know, is it about um, discrimination against one group that has a historical basis, which would mean we need to think both about uh, reparational acts as part of how we do public health at practice. We might have to also think about how one moves to compensate within a policy for past bad acts. And then you think about the future. You know, how are we gonna redistribute that which has not been uh, equally shared so we can get to what the first presenter said, so we can get to equity. Um, so the tensions that we are seeking to live into and practice moral courage look something like this, I think, today. There's a tension between how can what the interventions are, how that can they can be effective in tension with cost benefits. You know, how can it be effective, but also how can we pay for it? <laughs> Secondly, the tension of discerning what we owe each other. You know, that's what justice is really about. What we owe each other and how what we owe each other may lead us into questions of how do we differently serve different groups in the society and it still be just. We also are weighing individual freedom and which is autonomy, the right to make choices with wider social goods. And we wanna think then about individual responsibility as well as rights of people within the context and communities. And therefore, you know, what's our social contract with each other and how do we maintain it? So private goods versus public interests. So, uh, ultimately, what I want to suggest to you is that an ethical frame for public health ethics, practice, and the way you think about it theoretically should be one that pushes us to think about how we live into the tensions of doing what I call countercultural and justice work, because both of those have to happen when we do really, really good public health work. So how do we get so that we can live in that overlap and become creative partners in designing interventions and policies that actually live into the tensions? Don't resolve them necessarily, but don't ignore them for sure, and use them to creatively construct new responses. We understand that we live in a context that's dynamic. So the answers we may come up with, the ethical responses for now, may not be the same <laughs> later on. And we have to come back together, be willing to come back to the table and grapple. So 
fundamentally in a context where the omnipresence of violence is the pervasive way in which we live out our lives, I think we have to ask ourselves, can we or are we willing to be morally courageous in ways that are countercultural and about the business of justice? Thank you. So now we have an opportunity to open up the microphones and to uh, invite our online viewers for questions or comments. Just be before we get started, I, I want to summarize a little bit on what were the themes of the two presentations. So the uh, first presentation by Ms. Moore uh, really uh, posited a uh, a uh, not a conundrum, I would say, but definitely a, a problem in terms of how public health and public health data is um, understood and uh, digested. Um, she posited that we should consider looking at data in ways that help to provide uh, an indication of a larger narrative that the data may not uh, appropriately uh, describe, but that hints at, right? That the data is a reflection of a larger narrative of people that that data represents. And Dr. Riggs presented what for me is a major conundrum and is this issue of, you know, as public health practitioners, how do we manage an environment of tension between, uh, you know, uh, understanding that we are surrounded by all of these different sources of violence in our lives, um, regardless of who we are, how old we are, um, or what our position is. Um, and then what is our particular role within that environment of violence? If we're committed to doing work uh, social justice work, um, and that um, as we figure that out, it might require that we take a countercultural approach. But the question here is countercultural to what? Right. So that environment uh, which permeates everything that we do in our lives when we when we watch TV, when we play video games, when we when we go to see a movie, when we're interacting with people in the supermarket. There are all kinds of macro and microaggressions that we're managing or that we've grown accustomed to, right? So, you know, how do we manage that? And from a principle of ethics, what do we do as agents of change in public health to really ensure that we're moving as agents of change in social justice? Some really interesting uh, questions for us to consider. Um, one other thing that I want to point out um, again is that Ms. Moore pointed out that there are a whole host of resources that, given that she represents um, HHS and, um, and a major uh, agency within HHS, SAMHSA, that there are major sources of resources that SAMHSA has made available to support a national uh, um, uh, partnership network of organizations and individuals who are committed to this kind of change in communities. There are things that people can do. This is not simply a theoretical exercise. There are opportunities to engage and be engaged by other partners. And so she gave resources that are at the table on the, on the corner by the microphone um, to everyone's right. Um, and so we encourage people to take the materials go online, get connected, um, because part of what prevents us from becoming agents of change is being isolated. And there's no reason to be isolated in moving forward. So now I'm going to open up the microphones for any comments or questions uh, for the two presenters.
And you also have the microphones at the table. Uh, if you want to ask a question, you can just press one of the mics on the table, or you can come up to the mics in the room. Thoughts, questions, comments? Um, hi, um, my name is Katul Muhammad. I'm getting my master's in clinical psychology right now. Um, Can you speak a little closer to the mic? I'm, I'm having a hard time hearing you. My name is Katul Muhammad, and um, I'm getting my master's in clinical psychology right now. Um, one of my concerns as a young adult right now, what would be on your part? What would be some resources that I could take to be more aware of the public health and um, mental health combination? I want to start with congratulating you on your choice. Mm -hmm. It's a great professional endeavor. And I, I think there are a number of practical ways. So in part by sharing resources that allow you to take action from wherever you are, is so that you can start that practical application of the theory. There are also a number of internships and fellowships that I would encourage you to take advantage of. And we can offline definitely connect you to some of those directly. But I, I do think applying theory as early as possible is one of the best ways to anchor the learning and making sure that we're able to take advantage of your educational experience. Good afternoon. The so, Dr. Riggs, the is this does this model presuppose? On, does this model only presuppose a religious way of a religious response, a way, religious way of dealing with the um, the culture of deception and conflict and so on? Well, what's important about it is religious is not referring to particular doctrinal or denominational or traditional, you know, um, ways of being religious. Religious has to be understood here in this framework as whatever is used by an individual or group to define what is of ultimate concern to them. That's what religious stands for here. So what's religious for you or me may be connected with some particular tradition, but what's religious to someone else may not be defined by membership in some religious tradition or church or synagogue or whatever, but instead has to do with what gives their lives ultimate meaning. So someone um, grounding themselves in this dynamic is a resource for overcoming uh, substance abuse. Is it also a resource for dealing with mental health issues? Someone grounded in this perspective, and I was really thinking about the practitioners of public health. Someone grounded in this perspective is willing to grapple with individuals and communities about what substance abuse and mental health is first and the ways in which they respond to it in their communities and then begin to grapple together for answers in terms of what kinds of interventions would make sense, what kinds of solutions might make sense for now. Um, it's it's really a framework that also, I guess the other way I could have talked about describing our context, it's to invite anybody who's willing to be countercultural in the sense of not buying into 
the kind of culture of absolutism and polarization that we live in today. <laughs> I'm sorry. Can you define culture of absolutism and polarization for the... You know, <laughs> well, I'm defining absolutism as a culture in which people hold their positions as and their commitments as positions of certitude, of absolute truth. <laughs> and therefore, they don't see a need to engage someone who has a different position. And consequently, we end up with partisan polarization, <laughs> people standing on uh, each side and maintaining that side at whatever cost. People who are willing to work in this religious ethical frame are willing to say, hey, I can stand here and invite the polar polarities, the people in their polarization to grapple for new meaning together, rather than staying in a culture of absolutism and certitude where all we do is make claims and counterclaims against each other. Can I just add one piece to that? Because I think you raise a, an interesting point. And in having um, just had the opportunity to meet Dr. Riggs, it's been a real interesting um, alignment of experience and perspective. But it reminds me also of one of the closing remarks from this morning that looked at principles of equity and health equity in particular, where we were trying to address issues that are avoidable, systematic, and unfair. And with that thinking and in the space that you've defined, I imagine work that's related to policy and practice that's more inclusive in the dialogue than um, not inclusive, and that where the paradigm can be more pliable and relevant. And in that relevance, I think we have opportunity for being accepted and effective in ways that we have yet to see. Yeah. The posture of a person practicing religious ethical mediation and the policies you would come up with would be adaptive and responsive. <laughs> yeah. Judy? Uh. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Hi, thank you for um, all this very interesting stuff. I'm I'm feeling um, I'm feeling stuck in a model, and I'm feeling there's a lot of really fascinating theory here. But I'm thinking about some of the discussions we have. It's I'm I'm CDC, and um, I think a lot about how health departments can do things differently. But I'm thinking about children versus adults. And when we talk about um, people who are in the system of substance abuse or people who use substances, we often think about adults and um, yet children are in the in this environment. And I wonder if if you take this model and and think about children who are exposed to to this kind of these kinds of situations, the omnipresence of violence, for sure, would be a way, a place where children are found. How do we, how, how can we think about this more practically, I guess, thinking about those kinds of age groups? Does that make sense? Yes, I think so. You can tell me if I don't I answer don't your question, okay? <laughs> that will mean I didn't understand. But um, one of the things that about this model is it invites folks to think about who are the partners to the conversation. So if you're dealing with children, uh, your practices are not going to be conventional necessarily. Dialogue happens differently. I mean, art therapy is one of the things that folks use, art with kids, for example. So you begin to think about what are the ways kids communicate? You know, the model does not preclude them as partners engaging in the dialogical kind of encounter that this is calling for. It does require us to think outside our boxes.
Does that make sense? One of the things that um, comes to mind in this discussion are conversations that we often have in the office um, where when we talk about advancing health equity in practice, um, uh, we've talked about how we want to convey that often it doesn't mean that our actions in public health need to change. Um, so much as our understanding of why we're taking the action. And both of you, for me, in your presentations spoke to that in how we look at data and what we think data is telling us and what may be missing in, the, in that data that we need to do further investigation around um, so that we're not... Um, um, blindsided or coddled by our confidence in that data and then also how we're engaging our partners and, and what do we think is feasible or actionable right if we're only staying within the lane or within the model there are a whole host of practices or techniques or methodologies that we're not going to even consider because they're they're not normative right and so we have to be creative in not necessarily um, having to construct new models or new strategies, but taking the models that we've, we've used in other settings and in other contexts and using them in new ways or with new audiences. So it's, it's a highly iterative and creative process. And who said public health is boring? I don't say public health is boring. I never say public health is boring. But I want to... Um, Take this time if if there are it, to see if there are any questions online. Do we know if there are any questions that came online? No. Okay. All right. So at this time, then I want to thank our two presenters and please give the our presenters a round of applause. <laughs> and so I want to take the last few minutes um, to. Um, present a certificate of, of appreciation to our, uh, both of our presenters. This is to uh, Rosalind Holiday Moore in recognition and appreciation for your participation in the CDC Office of Minority Health and Health Equity 2019 Public Health Ethics Forum at CDC on April 26, 2019. Please come up. And this certificate of appreciation is for Marcia Riggs in recognition and appreciation for your participation in our 2019 Public Health Ethics Forum. Thank you, Dr. Riggs. So now this concludes this session. Thank you.